we're going to shift over to questions and answers. Um, I'm going to put and leave this information um, up on the screen as we go through questions and answers. Um, this is, uh, again, these are the best ways to get in touch with the project team. And there's multiple ways of doing so. So please feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'll respond um, uh, in a timely manner for folks. So thank you for being patient with us and uh, listening to me uh, uh, talk to you. And uh, we would uh, we'll love to uh, take some uh, questions now. So Mike, as the, um, as the host, would you be able to stop sharing and spotlight the panelists so you can have their video shown as we answer questions? Uh, you do that by right-clicking on the panelist's name. Okay. Oh, actually, we can see everybody who has their video. See everybody on. now? Yep. Okay. Um, um, we do have some in-room questions. Okay. Uh, let me just turn the lights off. Sorry about that. That's abrupt. That's a huge downside of this room, so. You were first. Do I go into this? Uh, nope. This is actually the microphone. You can talk in the tiniest voice out in the hallway and they will still hear you. Okay. I'm the Brady Klein Majestic on Ledge Road. I want to know what's going to happen to the building. Majestic building. So, Laura, I couldn't, I, I okay. could barely make that out. You may have so to uh, repeat the, the questions. Yep. The question is what is planned to happen to the Majestic building? So, the Majestic property um it will it will remain in place um we're going to be uh constructing reconstruction and access uh from their parking lot into the roundabout um so they'll have direct access uh safe access into the intersection and then we'll be uh, reconstructing their um access uh, along ledge road and repaving their um, parking lot yep we have uh, had another interim question Actually, I have two. One's on the plan and one's on the construction. Uh, I'm sorry, I haven't been to any meetings before. Uh, and thanks to everybody who, who participated in this. This is great. Um, I live on Locust Street and left turns coming north on Shelburne Road. I, I've already seen one rear end happen. And I almost got T-boned once by a guy going in the wrong lane coming north on Shelburne Road. So that was pretty scary. Um, but, but my main concern looking at this project now is that if, if you come out of Locust Street and you're trying to go south on Shelburne Road, especially in, um, you know, in cases of he heavy traffic on Locust Street, which are, you know, when the school's coming in or leaving, you know, in morning and afternoon, and maybe once, maybe once the Southern Connector is built, there could be even more traffic people uh, coming off the Southern Connector wanting to get back on Shelburne Road. We'll have to see about that. But anyway, what happens is uh, people coming up Locust Street, especially from the school, want to get onto Ledge Road. And it's not clear to me what the intent is on this plan, because what happens now is that people coming up that street trying to get onto Ledge Road just stop there until there's a free space to turn left onto Ledge Road, right? And I see here, it, it seems to me from the drawing that you've got two spaces now to turn left onto Ledge Road, which is an improvement, but it's not clear to me whether you intend for these people to come into the rotary and just go round and round the rotary until there's spaces for them to turn left. Uh, did you consider allowing traffic to turn right onto Shelburne Road? You know, it's it's confusing to me what's happening there. Maybe you can explain it, because I, I'm frequently caught behind, you know, three or four cars that are all trying to go up and Ledge Road, and nothing happens because they can't turn left, right? And so traffic is stopped coming up Locust Street. So maybe can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So when you're exiting the roundabout to go down Shelburne Street South, um, there's uh, the exit's going to be wide enough for two cars. So you, uh, the car, uh, if you were going to go down Shelburne Street, you would stay to the right side. And then there'll be a striped uh, pavement marking 
uh, left turn bay for the folks that are trying to uh, turn left onto Ledge Road. So there's okay, so it, it isn't clear. That's good. It's it's not clear from this drawing because you've got a yeah. like a green space. I couldn't tell if it was Greenway or or what is it. But what you're saying now is that there's going to be actually two lanes coming east on Lo Locust Street to join at the Rotary. Is that what you're saying? One well, lane that you can just turn right onto Shelburne Road, and another one for entering the Rotary and turning left. So there's only one lane that enters the roundabout. Um, in all directions, and okay. um, including Locust Street. So if you're on okay. Locust Street, you would take a right. If you wanted to go left on the immediate left onto Ledge Road, you would stay to the left after you turn, made your right hand turn, and, um, and and take the left turn that way. The the the, the left turn bay is to uh, allow folks that are trying to travel south uh, to go around and not back into uh, the roundabout. But you, you, are, you haven't answered my question really, and that is, let's say there's three cars trying to all trying to go up Ledge Road, which is frequent here, and there's a fourth car that just wants to get into the rotary, or, or a, even simply just wants to turn right and go south on Shelburne Road. Are you, are you intending that the cars to turn left on uh, Ledge Road because there's no more spaces are just going to go round and round the rotary? That, that you want them to enter the rotary there and proceed with the rest of the traffic or are they stuck there and is everybody stuck behind them until they find space that's and and furthermore if there are no if if those two spaces are filled and there's other traffic coming north on Shelburne Road which is frequent in the morning right it's Shelburne Road's going to be like a constant procession of traffic and so those people aren't going to be able to get into the rotary because the people in Ledge Road are waiting and they can't turn left. Hopefully, they're not going to be blocking the intersection, right? For those people turn. So I'm bringing up all these points. Might be too late, but uh, I guess what I'm asking is, could there be a a right turn lane there, uh, or is that just con contra indicated by the whole design? Yeah. So we're 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 beyond the point of design. We're at the point of construction at this point, and so uh, we're not making okay. any more changes uh, to okay. the design. Um, the uh, we have modeled the traffic in that area, and we took into consideration uh, the traffic north down on Shelburne Road um, and the traffic that turns left onto Ledge Road and found that uh, while the space to turn left, we would have liked it to have been longer, but the existing streets are where they're at. And um, so we had to make do with the spaces uh, as much as we possibly can. So for folks that are turning right into um, the roundabout from Locust Street, we would ask that they exercise a little judgment. And if their intent is to make a left onto Ledge Road and they see the, the bay full, we would ask they would probably um, not enter the roundabout um, or uh, seek another route until that um, that that bay opens. And so part of part of the, part of the solution is that we have the don't block the box. Uh, for northbound Shel uh, Shelburne Street traffic. And I know a lot of people don't always abide by that. Sometimes they stop in the blocks and they're not supposed to. That then becomes an enforcement issue. Um, but that box is to kind of help remind northbound travelers that if you see somebody turning left and, and traffic in front of you has not yet entered the roundabout to leave a gap and try to let those left turners in. So we're trying to encourage folks to Okay, so I think, just let me restate, the answer to my question is, you don't want those people turning left onto the ledge road to enter the rotary if there's no available spaces there for them to wait. You want them just to wait there at the stop sign until there are spaces for them to turn left onto ledge road. Is that correct? Yes, and it's not... Okay. It's not the, necessarily the best solution, but it's a better solution than having them try to circulate in the roundabout and then blocking up the roundabout. Okay, uh, it's no worse can... than we have now, so I, I admit that. Yeah. Okay, so I, the second question does pertain to construction. Uh, I live at the corner of Caroline and Locust, uh, and I'm assuming, although maybe tell me I'm wrong, that there's gonna be some staging in all you know of equipment because there's a 
you know, there's a big space to park right across from my house, right at the park there. And you're, you guys are going to have a lot of equipment to stage. So you mentioned earlier in the presentation that the construction was going to be from 7 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. or even later, depending. So what I'm asking is, can we at least make it very clear to the construction people that they shouldn't start backing trucks up and beeping at 6.30 a.m. when all the construction people arrive. That 7 a.m. is really means 7 a.m. and that's when the noise should start. That's, that's what I'm asking. Is that, your, is that your opinion and your understanding? That 7 a.m. is when construction noise starts? Except when you're working all night, of course. Um, I'll have Matt Wheeler uh, talk a little bit about this and what their intentions are. Um, I, I, I will say, I will before he speaks, um, I will say contractually speaking, the contractor is legally or allowed to work before seven o'clock. They can work as early as 6 a.m. However, we are, aware, we are aware that this is a residential neighborhood and the contractor has already stated that uh, they're aware that folks don't want to be disturbed at 7 a.m. or you know before 7 a.m. if possible. Um, I, I don't think that any of us could say here that uh, tonight that you know we're absolutely going to wait until seven o'clock and then start up. I mean, sometimes things have to start a little bit earlier, but we are mindful of that. And um, the contractor, you know, Matt and SD Ireland are aware and are sensitive to um, folks living in the area. Matt, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, we. We want to be good neighbors too. We we don't want to wake people up. We don't want to be extra noisy before seven. So you know, we'll we'll tell our crews. You know, if they're in the middle of the intersection or something, that's one thing. But as far as a staging area near residential properties, you know, if we're close to a house, we're 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 going to try to be as less noisy as possible. And uh, I, I don't think we're going to stage too much on Locust Street, um, maybe just pipe and catch basins, but we haven't worked, worked through those details yet. Okay, thanks. Just one more short suggestion. Uh, if you do close off, uh, you, you said you were going to, you know, there'd be times when traffic was going to be very restricted uh, at the top of Locust Street. Obviously, people are going to divert and they're going to go down to Pine Street, you know, to try to get where they're going. So the suggestion is you might want to do something at that intersection of Locust and Pine to allow people to turn, you know, left. Now, right now, it's pretty difficult to turn left, especially with traffic coming into the city in the morning. There's no signal there. Uh, so, you know, just, a, just an observation. Um, Thank you. We have one more in-room question, and then maybe we can go to the Q&A. Sure. I have several, but I'll try to be brief. My name is Dr. Craig Dwyer. I'm the principal of Christ the King School, which is in the epicenter of the whole construction project. And I, I know this is complex, and uh, everyone's inconvenienced by construction, so there's not going to be uh, a solution that's probably can be noiseless or... Or, or, or seamless. Um, so the school operates with 200 students currently enrolled. So to, to be proactive, I already reached out to the parents and provided the videos that were online to the 200 parents. And to be proactive, I'm going to have stage staggered drop off so all 200 parents don't come at once during this construction. Um, have them in state of 50 coming at a time to drop off their children. Um, you mentioned in the presentation about utilities and the possible shutoff, which is going to be apparent with all the work. And whether it's electric or water, I know you said 48 or 72 hour notice, it's going to obviously impact the school building because school can't be in session without electric and water. Do we know if the electric and water to the school building comes from Shelburne Road or comes up from Pine? And if so, is, is that a standard to give me 48 hour notice? Because I have to inform 
200 people of this and staff that the school has to be closed. So it's, it's gonna impact this 504 non, nonprofit, 504C nonprofit. I guess my concern is long-term if parents, if this is, um, I don't know if there's gonna be, again, uh, temporary stoplights, like at the end of Pine and Locust, a stoplight placed there potentially, or, or crossing guards, or how the traffic is going to flow because it's not a public school, so people choose to be there. And if this is a huge inconvenience, they can choose not to be there. So it's a concern as a school that sort of operates as a business in a sense. It's a, it's a unique circumstance to be in. But in terms of shutting off utilities to a school, is there a way that I can know more than 48 hours if it's an extended period of time or if it happens by accident, how, how are we, be informed of that. So is someone going to call the school or they have a specific contact person at the school? Let's say something happens during the school day that the water has to be shut off. It's an emergency. How will we be notified? Yeah, those are good questions, Dr. Goyer. I, um, you know, I think, you know, we'll do what we possibly can to give the school as much notice as, as possible. If we know if there are planned outages, uh, we want to give everybody as much notice as possible. Um, and for you, especially, it, it does, you know, it does have a big impact in closing of school. Obviously, you would want to know ahead of time. Um, we'll work with with Matt and his team and and try to um, uh, and also BED as well, especially for the electricity um, um, to give you guys as much lead time as possible. Um, as you mentioned, you know, things do happen during construction. Sometimes uh, accidents happen or a water line gets broke or whatever, and you have to uh, deal with those situations as they arise. But I would, I would argue that those could happen even if there wasn't construction. I mean, it happens in the wintertime in the city of Burlington where a water line breaks. So, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we don't run into any sort of accidents like that or unforeseen uh, uh, shutoffs, but uh, we'll we'll do everything we possibly can to to get you guys as much notice. Um, I don't know if Laura or Matt want to chime in a little bit on that. Um, I do know where your water line is, and we can talk about that offline. Okay. Um, I don't think you're as affected as you think that you are concerned about, so that's helpful. But it does answer or could answer questions from other people who have a similar concern. So I think that um, hearing from Matt would be helpful. And then I guess I have a follow up with, I know we have eminent domain has taken possession of our field at the top of our property where children play. So I guess directing them to Callahan Park during recess would be best. Is it possible to have a temporary crosswalk from the driveway of the school across Locust so the students can cross to get to Callahan since they can't use the upper lot because that's going to be taken away for the rotary and will be a construction site for two years. Uh, was uh, was a, a, I think a crosswalk was just constructed at uh, Caroline, right? Or yeah, Caroline Street. That's true. Yeah, it's, I, um, I know it's a block away and it doesn't sound like a, a big issue, but for three-year-olds, that's, that's a long walk. So maybe, I don't know who I can, it's, contact with to have something temporarily just straight it's it's probably a conversation we should have offline um, okay. ireland has requested some use of the park across from christ the king so having children walk in front of their staging area may not actually be as ideal as what it looks like today um, but as matt said that is also still um, up under review and for discussion so it, it can be something that um, josh and kara who are here in the room are coordinating that with sd ireland um, I'm with DPW, and as odd as it sounds, I have no control over what parks lets them use. But I do know those conversations are happening. As it relates to the crosswalk, um, DPW would work with VTrans if that's ultimately a solution that can be permitted. Um, and that's actually also not my call. It belongs to the DPW Commission. 
Do you have a commissioner behind you, though, if you wanted to uh, chat offline as well? <laughs> so. A lot of people to chat. <laughs> I just um, want to say that seeing the, the rope together three year olds cross Caroline Street in the morning is like a high point of my day. So, you know, you're taking that away from me. Um, so I'm going to mute us for a little bit unless you want uh, one of us to answer, but let uh, Delia maybe go through some of the questions, if that works. Sure. Um, and Mike, I did get the questions from Laura. She sent them over, so I'm happy to filter them through to you so you don't have to scroll through. Thank you. <laughs> um, the first question is, what is the cost of this project? So the cost of the project, um, uh, SD Ireland has bid uh, a convenient amount of money of $7,777,777. Um, I think they were hoping for some good luck on this project. Um, uh, that's that's what the bidded amount was. That's uh, a public figure. Uh, the costs, you know, uh, that's what we're, we're that's what we're shooting for. So uh, obviously things happen during construction, and sometimes we need to uh, overrun on a few things. But uh, generally, we're looking at the uh, high sevens, low eight million dollars. Great. And we touched upon this a bit, but um, will the project go dormant over the winter months and? To add to that, if so, what is that? What time period might that cover? So, we 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 think, generally speaking, there won't be much winter work. Now, that's not to say that there won't be, um, but um, if there is, it would be. I think winter season is December fifteenth. Well, technically, it's October fifteenth through April fifteenth, but. Uh, you know, December 15th is like really when we shut, sh you know, shut everything down. Um, but there could be some winter activities. We're hoping we try to minimize those. Um, are there any contingencies for adding a second lane if it is discovered to be bottleneck with the narrowing to one lane heading north on Shelburne Road, which currently is very minimal? So one of the, it, during back in the scoping phase of this project, the city had requested that um, as part of the single lane roundabout alternative that design included uh, extra space. So if for some reason traffic got really crazy in 20, 25 years that they could come in and easily add a second lane northbound. Um, so we've built that space in, in case it ever needed to get put back. Um, we don't anticipate that happening. Uh, single lane roundabouts can easily handle the traffic that we've measured out there. Um, and in fact, uh, over the last five, six years, the traffic out there has been slowly declining. Um, so we're keeping an eye on the traffic levels there, plus also um, the Champlain Parkway, when that gets constructed, uh, will have some sort of impact to traffic on Shelburne Street. What that is, we don't know. Uh, it's really hard to predict whether it's going to increase volumes or decrease, but um, the, the, the traffic volumes are likely to uh, change one way or, in, in, or in another. So. All right, thank you. And uh, what situations would be considered special situations that would allow work to happen on a Saturday? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if Josh or Matt, I don't know if sometimes things come up during the week that we can't address, like late on a Friday night or something. I don't know. Um, Matt, do you have any? Um... Yeah, I can handle that one. Uh, special instances where, say, we don't get to finish a sewer main and we have to connect something in, um, at least within, you know, 24, 48 hours, we'll, we'll work. But Typically, the guys don't work past noon, one o'clock on Saturdays, um, or emergency situations where, say, we had a under unknown water line that we unfortunately found, and we have to work through the night or something to repair that. Um, those are two instances that I can think of. Thank you, Matt. Um, we have someone who's put in a question uh, that represents a property owner trying to schedule a six inch water main upgrade um, to 111 Shelburne Street. And they're wondering who the best contact person is, whether that's SD Ireland for scheduling. 
Yeah, they can um, they can call SB Ireland's uh, main office and ask for myself, Matt Wheeler, or Brian Meir, and uh, we can we can discuss that. Thank you. Um, another question: Will Shelburne Street still have four lanes for cars? Shelburne Street south of um, Adams Court will still be four lanes. Um, north of that, um, the southbound traffic will have two lanes to Gove Court. Um, and then the northbound will be, uh, will be merging to two lanes into one um, from Adams Court to uh, the entrance to the roundabout. Thank you. Uh, someone noted that it looks like coming off Ledge Road, the angle to get fully into the roundabout looks sharper than most, making it more difficult to safely enter the traffic flow. Is that the case? Uh, no, we, we, we've analyzed car uh, tracking and um, turning movements. Um, so the curbs have been designed to uh, accommodate uh, vehicles making um, predictable movements. Uh, will there be blasting work through the hard rock that will be encountered? And how will people in the area be notified if there will be utility shut off? Sorry, kind of combined two and one there. Yes, we talked We talked most about this uh, in the, the presentation. Um, blasting is, is certainly possible. Um, obviously, being in a residential neighborhood, we're trying to minimize that. Um, but uh, it, it could very well be inevitable. Um, and then uh, if, if you, again, if you're concerned, uh, feel free to, to sign up for our updates. Um, if you fall within that uh, thousand foot radius, uh, please provide us your contact information so that you can, we can reach out to you. Um, but there'll be, we have, that's why we brought WSP on board to provide public outreach so that we can uh, cover all the channels and, and try to get as much information out to um, adjacent property owners and the traveling public as, as soon as possible. Yes, and anyone on this call who wants to join the email list, please feel free to submit your email in a, in a question. We will add it to the distribution list. Um, another question, has consideration been given to integrating into this plan one or more permanent underground crosswalks to enhance traffic flow and pedestrian safety? Underground crosswalks? Yes. Um, I, I'm assuming that would be uh, like a pedestrian tunnel of sorts. Uh, consideration was not given in this case uh, due to the presence of ledge and um, just the buried in, uh, utility infrastructure under there. Um, it would just be too costly and too invasive um, to construct such a, a, a structure at this particular location. Um, how do you see accessing and exiting Gove Court being affected with the new restricted lane patterns? So Gove Court will be open to the extent possible um, during work on Gove Court for the installation of a water line and a sewer line. Um, there may be some closure or at least some one-way alternating traffic for folks. We we are uh, we know it's a dead end street and. Um, folks only have one way out. So uh, again, we'll um, uh, try to make folks um, notified as, as, as much as possible, um, especially with their driveways as well. So we're gonna have to temporarily uh, block off a driveway while we're installing that utility infrastructure. So um, please sign up for, for updates and we'll be reaching out um, for sure. So this next question might be a little too specific, but uh, we'll see. Will there be a left-hand turn into 96 Shelburne if a driver is headed south, or is there a median that would block direct access? Um, I don't. Hmm, I don't know what 90, where 96 <laughs> Shelburne Street I, is. <laughs> that is the first property south of the condos where the Rotary Golf was. Okay. Um, let me bring up a plan here and just see. Um, right, so 
uh, there will be no restrictions to uh, entering or exiting that driveway. Um, the, the, the raised island is actually north of that. So um, the, uh, the residents at that location will be able to uh, enter and exit left and right, um, just as they do today. And in relation to the same property, will you have that up? Uh -huh. um, will any of the permanent updates be removing and or moving onto that property? Um, so the um, the road is the 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 street is actually going to be pulled away from the um, the uh, the property at that location um, because we're going to be uh, down to one lane northbound um, in front of that house. Um, and then also we will be constructing a shared use path um, that will be replacing the sidewalk in front of that property as well and the properties on either side of it as well. So um, traffic will actually be a w further away from the house than it is today. Okay, and then what does the ro roadway and shared use path include? Uh, pedestrians and bikes? The shared use path is meant to accommodate both um, uh, pedestrians and um, bicyclists who don't feel comfortable riding in the street or uh, are uncomfortable taking uh, a, a biking through a roundabout. Um, there'll be a bike ramp that will allow those folks to bike off the road um, and navigate the intersection um, uh, via that, that uh, facility. And then there'll be bike ramps on the other side to let them enter back into the street if, if that's the method that they choose. Uh, believe they can also ride on the sidewalk uh, in Burlington. I don't think that's against the ordinance. Um, but for folks that are on uh, the street, this is an alternative for them. Could you please explain the configuration of the sidewalk at the south leg of the roundabout on the east side? Um, I'm confused about the route of the sidewalks and what look like islands. So I'm guessing this is probably in the uh, vicinity of where ledge road comes in. Um, so the shared use path will approach the ledge road um, intersection and there'll be um, a crosswalk. And then there's an island and you can kind of see it in red if you're looking at the plan that we were showing earlier. Uh, that's a refuge island so that folks can um, only have to cross one lane at a time. Um, and it makes them more visible to uh, um, drivers. Um, and then once they get to that refuge island, they can um, uh, cross a, a second single lane um, to get to the other side of the road. Okay, I think we answered this question in the presentation, but maybe just to reiterate, if anyone joined us late, how much advance warning on any blasting? Um, that, that varies. Um, you know, obviously, if we know we're going to be blasting in advance or, you know, we'll, we'll try to make that as much as possible. I don't, maybe Matt can chime in in terms of specifics. I don't know what he's um, providing for, for advance warning, but um, I know um, at the actual blast, there are um, uh, certain time intervals leading up to the blast and there's got to be certain whistles and whatnot uh, at certain intervals. I, I think it's either like at five minutes and 10 minutes or something. Um, but in terms of the days, you know, I think that's where uh, maybe Matt can, can chime in a little bit. Yeah. So if we do have to blast, which I expect we will have to, A, the blasts are protected by blast mats to prevent flying debris. Um, they're going to be low frequency, low vibration blasts because we're going to be blasting in a tight area near utilities, so we can't blow up existing utilities as well. And then when prior to blasting, what we do, we have spotters and they they fan out along the sidewalks and roadways and uh, we block any pedestrians from getting into the area um, well in advance. It's typically 15 minutes before the blast. And then we also do rolling roadblocks so that basically we kind of, we don't stop traffic, but we slow traffic down to give us that five minute window to blast. So 
we we utilize typical procedures for everybody's safety and uh, make sure that we don't have any any problems there. And just to add to that, we were actually going to have a, a separate uh, blasting uh, presentation um, before uh, the first uh, activities involving blasting. And we're going to invite, we'll invite the, the property owners nearby and, and the public as well. But this is more, um, it'll be more specific. The topic is more specific and focused on blasting and lead removal. So there'll be a second um, one of these type of presentations um, sometime over the summer, I would imagine. Um, Mike, just a housekeeping thing. Someone asked if we could display the proposed design on the screen again while we go through Q&A. Sure. That might be helpful. There we go. Thank there. you. Sure. Um, another question. There are several small and two very large trees on the east side of Shelburne Street. Will they remain or be removed? Uh, east side. Um, I wish there was a little more specificity to that question. Um, there are some trees that will have to be removed, um, but we will be replacing trees. Um, and we have a whole landscaping plan um, that's been uh, blessed by the city arborist. And, um, you know, so we have some, uh, some native trees and, and trees that the city um, likes to use uh, disease resistant trees. So if there are any trees, uh, we generally will be uh, replacing them to the best of our ability. Thank you. Um, what would the longest time utilities be shut off? We have someone who's concerned they have tenants and they're concerned they might have to compensate for the inconvenience over two years. Well, it's really going to depend on the activity. Um, we want to obviously try to keep the, the shutoffs as, as short as possible. Um, but it's really going to depend on the utility that is being disrupted. Um, and that could be any, almost any length of time. Uh, it could be a couple minutes. It could be many hours. Um, but, um, you know, we'll obviously try to, um, you know, and I would think that we would try to estimate that if we can. It's not always possible. Um, um, but folks like BED and, and um, you know, the water department, they, you know, they're, they're in tune with usual, you know, rough, they have rough ideas of how long uh, a disruption needs to occur. Um, but I don't think we can necessarily uh, say for sure right here, right now, how long any particular disruption is going to be. It's going to depend on uh, the work involved and how smooth it goes or how rough it goes. So, um, that's why we're, we're trying to encourage folks to sign up and, and so that we can try to get as much information to them as possible. Um, and in terms of utilities that may be impacted, someone asks um, which utilities, would it just be electric water? All utilities. Oh. I, 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 if I'm, if I'm, I'm standing here, I, I, I'm telling you that it will, it will, it will involve every utility. Um, and you know, again, depending on the location of the utility is going to is going to determine, um, you know, again the duration and, and the level of disruption. So, um, expect uh, everybody should expect that their all their utilities should be disrupted at some point in time for some some length of duration. Great. Uh, we have a question about navigating the roundabout. Once you are in the roundabout, do you have the right of way? Once you are in the roundabout, you have the right of way. You show you should not you do not stop once you're in the roundabout. Um, if there's an emergency vehicle that comes up behind you in the roundabout, keep circling circling until you find your exit and then pull over to let the emergency vehicle through. Um, we have uh, we have um, produced. Uh, a couple videos for this project. If you go to our project website, you'll see a project specific video. And we also have a how to navigate the roundabout video. That's extremely helpful and it should answer almost all the questions that you have about navigating uh, a single lane roundabout. Thank you. 
Um, do you anticipate sidewalk and or street closures on Ledge Road or Locust Street? If so, signs a day or two before those streets closures would be helpful and notices at least a day or two before on front porch forum in Burlington. Thank you. We expect sidewalk closures on all streets at some point in time. Um, if you sign up for our weekly update, construction uh, updates, those closures uh, or the anticipated closures of sidewalks and streets uh, would be in those weekly updates. Okay. Um, what are the ribbon, the pink ribbons on the trees, and will those be removed as part of the project? We received a couple questions about that. I'm not sure if you know, Mike. Maybe Laura knows. I'm not sure what pink ribbons they are. Um, that's a good question. Laura, do you know? Um, the consensus in the room is we're not actually sure. <laughs> okay. We got a couple questions. So. <laughs> I don't believe they are related to this project. Could be wrong, but I don't think they are. It could have been our super SDR and supervisor marking some trees to get estimates for removal. But okay. again, I'm not 100% sure if it was or not. Thank you. Um, I'm concerned about commuters opting to take alternate routes through surrounding residential neighborhoods. Some of these neighborhoods have no sidewalks. Um, putting pedestrians and bicycles at risk from the increased traffic. Is there a plan to deal with this issue? I'm going to have, I'm going to have Laura answer that. Thanks, Mike. Um, uh, Mike touched on it a little bit in the presentation. The traffic control plan for this project is essentially restrictive to the contractor, that there is significant flow that is still required to be able to be handled um, throughout the project's construction. This was done with a lot of care and analysis um, to ensure that the volumes of traffic that occur during the day, whether it's commute hours or middle of the day, are satisfied. This has been reviewed by the city of Burlington um, and many, many other people besides myself. As it relates to neighborhoods, the routes that are identified as detours are well ahead of the project um, and not a lot of the smaller neighborhood entrances um, do we anticipate will be burdened throughout the project. Um, in addition, at the start of this project, the Pine Street Corridor has no immediate construction occurring. So as this project gets going, as commuters start picking their new routes, it is an open north-south corridor. Thank you, Laura. Uh, we have a couple questions related to driveway access. Uh, people just asking if their driveway, um, if they will be able to access their driveway throughout construction, um, during construction as well as utility work. Generally, yes. Um, if for some reason that work is occurring right in front of somebody's driveway, uh, Matt and his team will, will be sure to reach out um, with as much notice as they possibly can. Um, we also understand that some folks park on the streets uh, where it's allowed, so um, we're you know we'll be we're mindful of that as well. Um, but we want to try to keep access open um, as much as we possibly can. So any sort of closures of access would be as short as we possibly can manage. Uh, related to street parking, uh, someone asked if the parking at the corner of Shelburne and Locust will be impacted. Um, they have a five family house that relies on street parking for tenants. Uh, yes, uh, so on street parking on Locust would be impacted. Um, and um, I believe, you know, we'll work with uh, Matt and his team and, and Laura DPW uh, to um, uh, on, the, on the parking situation, getting uh, folks properly notified with as much notice as possible. Um, it could be that we need to find alternate parking uh, spots for folks uh, in the interim. Um, but if, you know, we wanna try to keep parking as, as open as much as we possibly can, uh, particularly at night, um, but in during the day when there's construction equipment or whatever, and we don't wanna be that close to park cars, then we would probably um, reach out to uh, have them relocated. 
Um, we have. Okay. A, oh, Sorry, if I can just just add, you know, the image that's displayed does still show that on street parking. Maybe not in that exact location as it's a little too close to the intersection, but on street parking will be restored up to the limits that are allowed with the new intersection configuration. Yes. Um, we do have a comment. Someone is suggesting temporary signals at the Howard and Pine Street and the Briarcliff Parkway and Pine intersections. So just wanted to share that. Um, and I'm looking through, I don't see many more questions here. Um, if anyone, I noticed someone did have their hand raised at one point, perhaps the question was answered. But if anyone is raising their hands, I'm watching and we can unmute you if you're raising your hand virtually or Laura, if there's any questions in the room. Oh, um, I have Amanda. Mike, would you be able to unmute Amanda who is raising her hand to ask a question? Yes. Hi, Amanda. Hey, I, I spoke to you in one of the MPA meetings. So I, I just want to get a sense of, so, right, are, are, are we saying that uh, I, I'm, at, I'm at that house that's right in front of the roundabout at Shelburne? Uh, it's the five family. Um, and we, we are concerned that right now we have uh, parking restrictions on the other side of the street and for obvious reasons, because there's a school there that needs um, traffic to be able to flow easily for drop off. But we're, we're also losing, uh, that there are no parking spaces up here once we lose what we will lose uh, to the roundabout. So is there going to be any accommodation? Are, I can't tell because I'm not looking at it before and after. So are there going to be accommodations made on allowing parking throughout the day, at least on part of the other side of the street on Locust, or is that not happening? I can take that one, Mike, if you want. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, we have not reviewed any regulatory changes that would be made to the parking conditions around the roundabout at this point in time. This is an intersection safety project, and that's really been the primary focus. Um, we do want to wait till we get a little bit further into construction to understand if there's any changes that are found for the unknowns in the streets that result in changes to the overall design before we go to the point of asking the DPW commission to ratify uh, the parking regulatory changes that would be with the intersection. So it's still forthcoming. Your concern is solidly noted um, about the change. It is a conversation that we would have at the neighborhood level to make such a change to the regulatory parking, regulated I, parking. I think you guys are doing a great job. And I said before, I've seen a number of accidents out there. So I know that this is necessary and important, but at the same time, I do wish, I know that this is at the state level. And so when you have a state traffic project with federal money that we're talking about a whole different ball game for how things get set up. But I do wish that there had been more local level conversations. I've been here for five years and I like I don't feel like we've ever been reached out to and, and we are going to be considerably impacted. It's going to be hard to get roommates now, given this level of construction. I wish that people had reached out to us for a little bit more input, not necessarily to become a problem, but to think about some of these issues. I also I told you before, I really wish that you would consider in advance of this project changing those those pathways to mark them to to differentiate between where bike bicycle bicyclists should be and where the little guys of christ the king might be walking um that i don't want to wait till there's an accident for that to happen um amanda did you provide your contact information so that as we do reach out um later on to to work through the parking we have a way of getting in touch with you? I, I emailed. I don't know if that suffices. Is there another place that I should be sending my contact info to? Uh, to the info at Shelburne Street Roundabout? Uh, yeah, I, I sent my, my email over there. I'll, I'll send another one just with better contact info. Thank you, guys. Um, Amanda, we did Thank receive your email address, so we have okay. that. But any additional information is helpful. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. 
And Thank you. I have a question here that I overlooked before, so I apologize. How far up South Willard, Willard Street will utility work go? And if we have specific addresses, that's what to ask for, if possible. Up South Willard Street? Yeah. Uh, South Willard Street uh, work uh, on both the road and the underground utilities uh, will end at Chittenden Drive. Um, so I believe we're replacing uh, two water lines in that location. Um, I don't, I think there's one house um, possibly, I know there's a driveway there, um, uh, but generally speaking, we're not impacting, uh, directly impacting uh, the services to the houses beyond Chittenden Drive. That doesn't mean there won't be shutoffs, but um, uh, direct, direct impact, we're not anticipating. Thank you. And I have one more uh, online question that we'll take. Um, and then I don't know if Laura has any just to wrap up because I know we're heading over time here. Um, is there a planting plan available to view online? Can we assume that all the bright green areas of the plan represent curbed grass uh, areas? Um, so yeah, what you see on the plan is um, uh, green and green is uh, grassed area. We're replacing the grass strips uh, between those streets, uh, the curbed streets and the sidewalk. Um, you can kind of see these um, um, uh, symbols here for where we uh, expect trees. Um, this isn't everything. Um, we have a detailed plan. I'm trying to think if that's public or not. Um, if it isn't, I think we could probably post some, we might be able to post something on our website. I'll have to take a look at that. And Laura, I see your hand is raised. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions to wrap up. We do have um, a few more in-room questions. I think. Um, Solve. Yep. I wanted to just do two things, make a comment. Some of the questions, I'm on the Public Works Commission in Wellington. Some of the comments of concerns are clearly related to not being familiar with the way roundabouts work. And I'm hoping that you'll see that they actually will work better. And there's two factors that are not obvious. The first one is that roundabouts slow the traffic down to the point where there's a there's an interaction between the pedestrian separate and in advance of having the car trying to get into the roundabout and also with other vehicles. So there's a different dynamic relationally to make these roundabout, to make the intersection a different experience. And that's not something you'll know until you've had that experience. The second thing I want to point out is that the placement of the crosswalks exactly makes it possible for the vehicles to deal with pedestrians or bicyclists before they're trying to negotiate their own entrance uh, uh, with other vehicles. Two factors that are not always obvious to people. And, and the second, my question really related to, is there, is there um, the traffic management plan, was that, ex uh, does that extend to the, uh, the issues that have been addressed in questions about Pine Street uh, traffic? Uh, did that traffic management, is anything being planned? I know those were concerns and that was one of my questions. Has anything been, was it part of the plan? how to handle that uh, that clearly anticipated extra load, however however you may be plotted. So um, yes, we, we did look at uh, traffic um, as, a, as it relates to Pine Street in terms of whether or not the roundabout during construction can handle that extra traffic. And it does, it, it, the, the site will have the capacity to handle an influx of traffic from, from Pine Street um, in the event that there was work or something happening down there. Um, long term, as I spoke earlier, you know, it's a little hard to predict exactly um, what traffic is going to do once the parkway is built. Um, so we couldn't predict that. So we, uh, so long term, we, we did not take into consideration uh, any sort of traffic from uh, a future Champlain Parkway. But during construction, the site can handle it. I'm sorry, not, yep. Um, so Mike, I think the question is more about as the traffic is detoured for the construction activities um, because of some one-way directionals that occur, how was that detoured um, or redirected traffic considered? 
it was studied. Uh, we had identified some detours, potential detours, and we think we might utilize the same detours during construction. Um, and we looked at alternate or um, adjacent intersections, such as Howard Street and St. Paul, the signal there, um, and a couple other key intersections in the surrounding area to make sure that um, that uh, there wouldn't be some disaster um, at those locations. And, and again, it, it's construction, so we have to all expect that there's going to be some level of disruption, uh, even outside of the the work zone itself. So, um, which is why we're trying to get out now, try to cover the whole city and even parts of South Burlington. We want to make sure that folks traveling up and down the corridor, Route 7 corridor, know that this has tentacles. This will this, you know, impacts to traffic uh, and all forms of transportation will be impacted. Any other follow-up? I, I think that addressed my question other than I think there might be a need to have just somebody at the bottom of those, those streets uh, for people to be able to get in and out. So almost you almost need traffic control people that will be, you know, helping people at those intersections because it will, the traffic will all go up Pine Street or down Pine Street, and, and that's what you sort of want to keep it away from the construction. So um, I think that'd be something that I would propose to the public. Yep, well, you have the uh, the construction inspectors that you're talking to right now, so yeah. they will. I think that's something that, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and you had an additional question? I just was curious, this with this diagram, the tan colored plots in there are homes and some businesses, is there, any, is there any significance to them? Are they the only, are they people that you've reached out to uh, individually? And then if so, then why people on Ledge Road uh, aren't, aren't shown there? And also, uh, Christ the King is not also in Jan, that where they cover land. Is it just a diagram that is not significant between the tan plots and the non-tan? Homes? There's there's no significance. It's uh, this is just a diagrammatic, uh, um, just to kind of give folks a sense of orientation and a visualization that they can focus on. Thank well, you. Yeah. And is signage is the signage going to be really good so people can know? Because half the problem is that people don't look at the rotary turnabout which way to go. Are you asking in its final condition or throughout the construction phases? <coughs> so, <laughs> well, we can get through the first two shakes first. <laughs> I think we have a lot of signs, probably. So during construction, signage is going to be absolutely crucial, and we're going to have, um, you know, a, a very uh, detailed traffic control plan that's going to you know, lay out where signs are, what the type of signs are, spacing of them, and the fact that there's going to be um, changing uh, traffic patterns throughout construction is going to make the placement of the types of signs and the placement of those signs crucial. So we have somebody constantly monitoring that. Um, it'll be part of the contractor's plan that they'll be submitting for approval. Um, both the state and the city will have approval authority on that. And um, in terms of the future condition, our roundabout signage, uh, warning signage is, is typical. It, it will meet all federal standards. Um, it will be in, generally in line with uh, signage that you find at other roundabouts in Vermont. Um, there being a city, things are a lot tighter. Um, so you might see um, the trick is to sign appropriately without over signing because we don't really want to overexpose folks and try to send folks too much information on approach to a roundabout. So it's a, it's a balancing act that we have to perform during the design. Um, and I uh, feel pretty confident in uh, the design that we have for signage for this project. Thank you. Um, just to add on to that, uh, one of the things that the city council actually did when they adopted this concept back in 2009 is tasked DPW with a proper rollout and a follow-up study for the roundabout. And so we've actually already engaged the Regional Planning Commission to help come up with a plan how to allow the roundabout to open 
with good outreach so that it will be as successful as possible. So that is something that we are already working on. It'll probably take us the two years. So we're glad to have the time. <laughs> Any other interim questions? All right, I'm gonna mute myself. And we have no more questions uh, virtually right now and no hands raised. All right. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to reach out to you. Please check out our website, uh, sign up for uh, updates and, and outreach. Um, it's, it'll be crucial uh, for you all for the next couple of years, and it'll be helpful for us as well. So um, we, uh, we look forward to uh, implementing this uh, successful safety project. Thank you.